So today, it's a roof that I need on a shed. We're putting in a metal roof. I paid about $300 for metal sales. Had to order it special from Home Depot. Uh, there's, a, there's a thousand other things I'd rather do today than this. Uh, so let me show you how to get through it as quickly as, you can, as I, I can. If you read the manual, metal sales, they'll tell you, hey, this is, you know, this is inherently dangerous, putting on a metal roof, etc., etc. Here's the shed with the roof removed. So you can see those two by sixes going away from me. But what's in front is a bunch of two by fours that I just picked up from Home Depot. Those are going to be going across. I have to sit, make these go crosswise across the two by sixes because the panels are going to be they're going to be parallel with the two by sixes. And I sketched this all out in advance so that I could figure out how much uh, material to buy. My first job is to go ahead and put the two by fours. You know, across the front, across the back, and then going across two by fours, going across here. These are the uh, the two by sixes run this way, up and down. And we've got five panels, five metal panels, actually four metal panels, and this one plastic, the light emitting panel. This one's good for about 25 years. These metal panels are good for 50 years. I'm probably good for another 20 years, so I don't care. Uh, really that much about it now any of you who are professionals are going to look at this and say look at that jackass he's uh, he's trying to put a, a a metal roof a PBR roof on a flat surface it's there's got no uh, it doesn't have the right angle here we need an incline one inch for every 12 inches well you know what that's what I'm stuck with the reason I don't just raise it up in the end is look how close it comes to the top of the wall that wall and and then the front over here well, that's when we start getting involved with what the Homeowners Association might complain about. Believe it or not, it's in the Homeowners Covenants that you, you can't have a shed that's visible from the street. Hey, that's great. They actually tried to enforce that one year, and so if I make this any higher, that's just inviting a whole nest of troubles. Okay, I'm marking this at 24 inch intervals, and then, uh, and then space your 2x4s 24 inches apart. That's where we're going to be. We're going to be attaching. Remember the metal roof directly to the two by fours. Twenty-four inches is what a lot of folks online say. They they actually say you're going to have to check with your local building regulations. Some people say thirty inches apart. I'm just going with twenty-four. I didn't bother to check. Okay, so now I fastened the two by fours to the two by sixes with those three-inch screws. I just drove this one screw in, and it didn't go in all the way, and then it just stripped, and I couldn't get it any further, so. Now I can't get it out because the, the, where the heads is uh, stripped. So, I, you know, this never happens in those other videos when these professionals do it. I probably spent the last 10 minutes just trying to get this darn screw out. These, these are the little things that makes it take 8 hours instead of 4 hours for me. There we go. There. See, there's, there's the kind of expert workmanship that's a hallmark of all my do-it-yourself projects. Take a look at this fine turn of events. I thought that this, uh, you know, these old 2x6s that are kind of bowed in the middle after 15 years, I thought they might screw this up. And sure enough, now that I've, you know, I've, I've attached that screwed down lock tight on my 2x4s that are going to be the substrate for the roof, when I locked them down to the 2x6s, it bowed the 2x4s. Look at this, I got... It's maybe three quarters of an inch, maybe an inch. I'm going to run out and get some 1x4s and just put them on top of here. I don't want this... Yeah, I don't, I don't want to be constructing basically a fish pond on top of my, uh, on top of my shed, because that's what's going to happen if I, if I lock this down tight with that bow in there. This is just going to gather water like it's a, like it's a son of a gun. Here's what it looks like after adding the one by fours, but it's still concave, and that's a shame. I found there's some e-flashing that Home Depot has that's uh, only five dollars a ten foot run. It's about four inches. Uh, good uh, drip e-flashing. I got the you know the fancy stuff that's the right color for the front because that's going to show, but that was. I forgot what that was, like $25 for a 10-foot uh, run. So, um, and it had the, uh, you know, the 45-year warranty uh, ColorFast coating. 
but this isn't going to be as good as that. It's just galvanized steel. So, I don't know. Uh, I don't really care too much because it's going to be in the uh, on the side and in the back. So this uh, this front eave, it's not going to it's not going to reach all in one piece. So I'm going to overlap these. So it looks like I will get a chance to make use of these tin snips uh, to do the corners. I just uh, I'm putting in the eave trim now. I didn't have the, the right size nail, so I'm just using these finishing nails. Finishing nails won't go through the, uh, through this uh, 22 gauge sheet metal. So um, I saw somebody online suggested this. You just get a bigger nail, use this, you know, to, to start the hole, and then, you know, don't go all the way in. Just make the hole barely enough so that the, uh, your nail will go through, and then finish with that. Now the reason you can get away with using the wrong size nails here these finishing nails is because the whole point is just to hold the eave trim in place until you later on lock it down because we're going to be putting in you know th shooting screws through this uh, all the way around you know I can see why the experts say uh, don't uh, don't do this uh, by yourself and it's dangerous the best way to do it stand them up you know stand them up on their ends and get them you know one man can do that and then lean them up against and just kind of push them up keep pushing it up until it balances out because if you do it the other way and you lose it man this thing will come down and it'll either cut your foot off or maybe cut your head off so these are pretty heavy and awfully sharp and do wear gloves uh, what I was able to finish up yesterday before the Sun went down was to get a chalk line on the um, the parts of the metal roof that I'm going to need to cut. I also went with a magic marker underneath uh, the other side and uh, you know just kind of mark what the angle is. So I'm going to need to cut that with some tin snips. I'm not sure if I bought the right tin snips. I bought the straight ones. You know you can get left or right uh, tin snips. These are airplane tin snips. And uh, from what I've seen, it's pretty easy to get it wrong when you're using tin snips. I'm trying to get these down so I can cut them. I've measured them. I don't have an assistant. I'm not going to be doing this the quote-unquote safe way, I suppose. But what I've learned from experience is you stand it on its end. You grab as high as you possibly can uh, so that you're above the center of gravity. And then you can just kind of lift it up. If you're going to send yourself to the hospital, this is going to be... What should we be doing when you do that, my guess. I just rented the uh, the nibbler for 25 bucks to cut my sheet metal for a full day. Okay, so I've got my rented nibbler, got my gloves, got some eye protection. Sitting on a five gallon drum. And uh, let's see how this goes. The nibbler is, you know, true to its name, it is nibbling through this steel. My grandkids are gonna be pulling this little shards of stainless steel out of their feet for the next 20 years so I've got a broom with me I'm gonna make sure I sweep all this up before it gets into the lawn you know, this video would kind of suck if we went the whole time without showing you how the nibbler actually works let's see what I can do with one hand It does a lot better when you're not holding a camera in your hand. Before I cut any more, let me see if my first cut shows me that I've done all my measurements correct. And let's see how this aligns. Well, it looks like it was actually delivered. Pretty cool. Hey, you see there's no room for flashing here. This first panel, I've lined it up with the cut. That's the best cut I could make, and it's lined up and it's covering the butyl putty. Best I can do, it's right up snug against it. Everything's hunky-dory, right? Well, no, not really. Take a look, it's not square with, uh, with the siding. It's about a three quarters of an inch difference. But you know what? I don't care what it looks like. 
I'm going to put some butyl putty underneath here. That thing's going to be locked in tight. That butyl putty is going to be covered with metal. It'll last 50 years. I'll never have to do this again. For the 30th time in this project, I, I'm giving up on these tin snips. These things have got, a, got such, a, such huge blades, you cannot get more than about an inch into anything. I don't care what. Maybe if you've got lighter gauge, maybe. I found one guy online, and he's a professional. This guy does this for a living. You know, unlike those of us that hate every second of this. He's the, the one guy said these are only good for trimming flash. And they are good for or trimming edge flash. They are good for trimming edge flash. I've trimmed all my edge flash with it. Fine tool for that. Anything else? My goodness gracious. Just forget about it. So back to the uh, back to this. Back to our nibbler. I tell you, if I had to do this again, which thankfully I won't have to do for another 50 years, uh, I would get the power shears. If you go to Metal Sales, who's one of the industry leaders for these metal roof, right? The 22, 26, and 24 gauge metal roof. You won't find them recommending any brand because they're trying to be, you know, they're trying to be coy. They're trying to be nice partners. They're trying not to favor one vendor over another, right? But deep within their website, if you do a deep search into all their PDFs, do a text search, you'll find the word power shears. And power shears is a brand name for an attachment that goes on top of a drill. Power shears, apparently, it's what all the guys at Metal Sales use. I should have rented some power shears or gotten the attachment itself. It's about a 90 buck attachment. Yeah, well, that's not going to happen. But anyway, the power shears are the things that you ought to get if you're, uh, you're going to do this for real. Because uh, they won't say it out loud anyway. But if you dig far enough on the website, eventually on Metal Sales, you'll find that that's apparently what they use. Okay, so let me bring you up to date. I've cut the metal. Wasn't pretty. Now it's time to fasten it to the roof. Well, it's just about time to bring these inside closures out. I thought I'd be doing this on the first day. Here it is like the fifth day. Hey, metal sales, yeah, do me a favor and don't uh, don't jam them all into a box. You know, like uh, like a little kid jamming dollar bills into his pocket. Uh, these things were all kinds of spaghetti bent, twisted, everything. I've got them hanging here for about three weeks. Uh, and they're actually straight now, which is the way they were in the catalog when I bought them. Now that I'm, uh, I'm actually, you know, got everything in place, it's just a matter of uh, putting these up here and, and then somehow inserting these little foam things here. Once I've inserted the foam, then uh, doing some butyl tape or butyl putty around them. I think this tape's a ripoff. I should just get the cheap stuff. Yeah, it's the same stuff. This is, uh, oh man, I don't even know how much this was. $15 a roll, I think. Same amount's about $5 a roll over at Home Depot. It's just a little different. So, I supposedly the tape makes it easier. Yeah, maybe for some people, not for me. You, you probably tried it the way all the, uh, all the pros do. You know, they put these things on in the shop, lay them down, adhere them. That's not working real well for me. They just keep falling off. So I just been jamming it in there after the fact and then putting some putty around them. Seems to work fine. Here you can see. It's not too bad. Just lift this up a little. Get that in the right place. Now this right here, this is particularly easy since this is the light emitting panel. It's made out of plastic instead of metal. But then once I've done that, then I'm going to go ahead and insert this underneath here, stomp on it so it adheres, then pick it up, then pull the tape off, and stomp on it again so it's on the other side. Believe me, I tried it a, like three different ways. This is the easiest way. And then, you know, once you've got those on, I don't even use the tape. For underneath here, I just use a line of butyl putty, the cheap stuff, and then stomp on that. And I think what we have is a waterproof seal when we're done. Yeah, there we go. That's so much easier than trying to put it on beforehand and get it on there without it falling off. Seriously, guys, you guys who do this for a living, are you sure this isn't the way you're supposed to do it? This is much easier than the other ways. The foam closures didn't uh, didn't always align properly, so I've got a you know I'm just kind of trimming some of this extra stuff and just jamming it in there to fit. 
Now do all of this before you lock it down for real going across the top with all the different screw fasteners. Now what comes up next is to fasten the roof to the 2x4s, the metal roof. And there's some wonderful illustrations from metal sales you'll find in the manual that explain how to do it in all different circumstances. There's this wonderful picture that shows, you know, kind of this mythical uh, house that's got every possible combination of, of what you might need to do for a house. Uh, all the page numbers are wrong, but other than that, it's, it's a real good way to figure out what your fastening pattern is going to be. In other words, where do you put the screws? And it's going to vary. The, the number of screws you put in at the front and the back on the edges of the roof are going to be different. There's going to be more screws there than in the middle as you'll see in this illustration. So uh, take a look at this. This will help you with your fastening pattern. I didn't really film much of this, but I will film some tips on how to uh, drive the screws the best you can. Okay, now here's the nice thing about watching a complete idiot do this instead of a professional. If you have to screw this in, right, that screw, what would you use? Would you use this? This is just what's laying around. So I got a, you know, a hex nut, um, socket wrench and a little adapter and I put that on the end of my uh, my drill and I use that right well you know what happens when you use this this thing wiggles all over the place I found out after using this for the first oh, I don't know 40 screws I, I realized hold on a second this thing it's wiggling right and left it's not straight half the time my drill slips right off of the screw and goes plowing into my nice 45 year you know, warranty, uh, color fast, rust proof roof and tears right through it, right? So I've got dings all over the top of my roof because I've been using this stupid thing. Here's an example of some of the damage I've done by having the drill slip off and dig into the metal. Found out for like four or five bucks, Walmart, you can pick up this, which is, you know, the, the right tool for the job. This does a much better job. So at the start of this job, make sure you go out and invest in one of these instead of just trying to do it like this. One more perfectly good day wasted entirely building this stupid roof. Okay, here we are on the fifth day. And by, by day, I mean, well, there's probably been two full eight-hour days and a couple of little two-hour days. Last week, I was able to use my nibbler to cut the sheets. And I wanted to get them up here so that the wind wouldn't blow them down. So all I did was put the very first row of screws in. This is the very first row on the left side of each panel. Got the panels down correctly. Uh, when you put them in, you put them in with the, uh, the larger end underneath the smaller end. That should be the direction the wind should be coming from that direction over here. So that it doesn't uh, go up underneath here. So wind direction coming this way. And it looks like everything's in good shape. Uh, as for the, the screw fastening pattern, uh, it depends on where you are. On the edge here, on the very edge, the bottom and the top, you want to go screw here, 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 and here. And then a stitch screw on top of the joints here. So you're always going to have a stitch screw. It's going to be a sh shorter one, about a half inch uh, sheet metal screw in there. Uh, now that's for the end. Uh, every 24 inches, you're going to want to have one just right here. So you don't have to you're here and then here and here. Or actually, it's going to be there, there, and there. So you don't have to do two like you do on the edges. So the top and bottom, we do two across. And then in addition, of course, you're going to put a stitch screw all the way up. The stitch screws are going to be every 12 inches. And I think the best reason to explain that is to try to keep this seal. See, that's, uh, that's where your butyl putty is. And um, so every 12 inches we do a stitch screw, not every 24 inches like you see there. That stitch screw just goes through the metal. That's not going down into the wood. So that's going to be every 12 inches. And that's our fastening pattern. As we move over, you see the shed is not plumb. It's not square. And so when we get over here, when I made this cut, we see that uh, it's not straight. It's out of alignment. It's more like a little trapezoid here. So uh, what do we do? I've looked all over the place. I've tried to figure out what do I do with that gap there. I suppose I could have just cut it straight and let it hang over. I've seen people describe that. But I'm just going to, you know, I bought like three bucks worth of foam 
insulation, the thickest I could find. I'm going to jam it in there. I'm going to put some screws in the top and and uh, jam it down into the wood, drill it down into the wood, seal it off, and that's going to be it. Here's what I've done with the uh, the side that didn't align right. I just uh, spaced them 12 inches apart, spaced the screws uh, 12 inches apart and then about 6 inches apart right here where I needed to just drive this and kind of bully the, uh, the metal down into making a good seal. So that's the lamest part of this whole project. So about the only thing left to do is, uh, is sweep it up. I'll tell you, I've had every pesticide, every, uh, every fertilizer you can imagine in here, you know, soak it in water for 10 years. I'm not taking any chances sweeping up this crap. So here's the end product. Cost about $400. I think I saved myself at least a thousand. And you know, that's, that's what it's all about. So let's take a look at what the job looks like after three years. The first time it rained, the roof leaked. I actually filmed that. Here's what I said. It looks like it's in the join between the, um, between the light emitting panel and one of the other panels. Not sure exactly why. I think it's this, maybe there's not enough butyl putty in here. But uh, that's a real disappointment, I gotta admit it. There may be a crack in, uh, in the light emitting panel too. And we'll have to fix this. After I filmed that leaking, I think I went up and pressed down a little bit on the top just to see if I could get the leak to stop. And, and for some reason it did. It's been three years and I haven't had any leaking since then. My big worry was that those black foam enclosures were not going to be waterproof, but they were. My second worry is that the sun and the heat would turn them into dry rot, as a lot of things do in Arizona, but thankfully that hasn't happened. And finally, that one part that I said was the lamest part of the project, where I had to cut diagonally across the metal roofing and then kind of bully it down, screw it down as tight as I could to flatten it out, even though it was all irregular at that one point. If you recall, I jammed a bunch of weather stripping, uh, plus some of the uh, the black foam of the inside enclosure uh, underneath that. And sure enough, the uh, weather stripping, that stuff just crumbled into dry rot. Uh, not a good recommendation. But thankfully, I had enough of that foam enclosure. That's the stuff with the, the real long warranty. So that seems to have held up fine. Even where it was exposed to the elements, it didn't crumble or go, go into dry rot. I want to add a final comment. The question always is, would you do this again? And I'll be honest, I would do this again because it was necessary. I would not do a do-it-yourself project like this by myself if it weren't necessary. They say the vast majority of people who do do-it-yourself projects that are big, you know, redoing a kitchen, putting in tile, that kind of stuff, most of them regret it. It got the job done. It saved some money. But, you know, they gave up six months of weekends that they'll never go back in their life. So... I wouldn't do this unless you had to or you think you could get it done quickly. And that's, that's what I did in this case, so I'm happy with the result.